Hey there, lovely listeners. I'm Juniper Owens, Director of the Academy of Integrative Mental Health and your host for today's conversation. And we want to welcome you to yet another segment of Common Client Conundrums today. And in this segment, we're here to just really dive into those topics that bring clients to the therapist's couch. And hopefully we will share some awareness and maybe even suggestions or tips that can add to your practice or mental health journey. And today we have a really special two-part episode in store for you, focusing on a feeling that most of us have grappled with at some point in our lives, shame and guilt, or if you're me, something you grapple with on a daily basis. In part one of this double feature, we're gonna shine a spotlight on guilt We'll be unpacking what guilt really is and how it can affect people on a personal and cultural level. And of course, again, we're going to hopefully dish out some practical strategies to help reduce its impact on our lives and our clients' lives. So whether you're tuning in during your daily commute, maybe you're a walk, or even if you're just chilling, trying to avoid doing some paperwork, stick around because... Who doesn't want to talk about guilt and shame? I don't know. Most therapists do. (laughs) All the time. We're always down for a fun conversation. Because you know what? Shame and guilt are 100% normal and common human experiences. Every mental health professional will encounter this with their clients to varying levels of intensity and distress. Because shame and guilt are highly complex emotions each tied to different aspects of our self-perception. And like I said, we're going to break this down into two parts. And we're going to, part one is going to explore guilt and part two is going to explore shame. But we highly recommend that you listen to both because they're connected and they often occur together or one before the other or vice versa. Because guilt and shame often overlap, but they can also manifest independently. So like guilt, a single episode of guilt could arise like when you accidentally infect someone with an illness, for example, or a mild or single episode of shame could arise when you're made fun of about an aspect of your physical appearance and, you know, internalize that. So to distinguish the two, another way of looking at it could be to consider this parental response to a child's behavior. So one, a parent saying, what you did was bad, that could induce a guilt reaction. Whereas a parent saying, you are a bad child, that could activate a shame response. As a psychologist, June Price Tangi and her collaborators have suggested, shame says there's something wrong with who I am, while guilt says there's something wrong with what I did. So guilt and shame have distinct characteristics that set them apart. So the first step to working with shame and guilt is to be able to offer a distinction between the two and increase awareness of the functions of guilt and shame, as obviously they're intertwined as much as different. So identifying religious, cultural, and psychological perspectives is also important to fully understand the roots and limbs of each type of shame and guilt you're working with because yes, they come in many flavors and textures. There's an important social role of shame and guilt, and psychoeducation around this can be invaluable to increase insight for clients who might be confused or stuck in the shame or guilt. Now, this is a quote from an article by Pines in 1995. It's old, but I still think it it stands true. Quote, Shame and guilt teach us through painful but inevitable trial and error how to adopt ourselves to social roles and how to influence others to adapt to us. We learn when and how much to be open to others, how to manage appropriate closeness and distance, how not to hurt or be hurt. And we learn to be human by knowing that we feel what others feel, end quote. Tangi and her co-authors explained it well in their 2005 paper, 
Quote, a shame-prone individual who is reprimanded for being late to work after a night of heavy drinking might be likely to think, I'm such a loser. I just can't get it together. Whereas a guilt-prone individual would more likely think, I feel badly for showing up late. I inconvenienced my coworkers. And the luckiest among us will experience a mix of the two. Like, for example, I showed up late, everyone is annoyed with me, and I'm a horrible person who can't do anything right. Does that sound familiar, anyone? So understanding the difference between shame and guilt. Primarily, shame is about you as a person and guilt is about what you did. You know, just to keep it simple here. Uh, Then once you have identified, is this about you? Is this about what you did Um, or a mixture of both? We want to kind of try to tease it apart as much as possible because sometimes the interventions for guilt are a little different than interventions for shame or sometimes the root causes or the experiences around it are different. So the um, environmental experiences. So one way of being able to assist clients in distinguishing between the two and figuring out what is it that we're working here, working with here, guilt or shame. You can do simple things like journaling or just jotting down when you feel a certain body sensation or when you're curious of what's arising. And some of the guiding questions for this could be, what thoughts are surrounding this experience? What feelings can you identify? Are there any core beliefs hanging around? Have you been working with core beliefs in your sessions? What do you notice in your body or where in your body do you feel this? Now, after increasing awareness and granularity around knowing what it is that you're experiencing and to what degree, and you have a little more information about it, then we can get more toward a clinical intervention. This is the part where we seek to allow the normal experience of guilt to transmute into what is it's supposed to be doing, which is offering security and attachment, connection, and our place in the community and the world at large. Remember, experiencing guilt is a normal human response to recognizing one's actions or behavior that might have harmed others or violated personal values. There is something to be distinguished here. Functional guilt, that's guilt that's saying, hey, you might have like hurt somebody or hey, you might have violated some kind of social norm and you're going to get kicked out of the group or whatever. Um, Like those, that's functional. But there's times when guilt can become overwhelming, persistent, or lead to severe emotional distress, which obviously contributes to um, depression, anxiety, or um, OCD, stuff like that. So let's discuss how guilt shows up for many people. And one word to use this is symptoms, or we can say effects, whatever feels right to you. So let's look at some of the emotional symptoms. We have Obviously, persistent feelings of sadness or depression, anxiety and worry, lower self-esteem, irritability or anger. Obviously, shame can come in there. Self-blame and self-criticism, difficulty concentrating, and a loss of interest in previously enjoyed activities. Physically, grief can show up looking like fatigue or low energy. It can show up in sleep disturbances, changes in appetite, headaches or body aches, and gastrointestinal issues. Behaviorally, uh, guilt can result in withdrawal from social interactions, difficulty making decisions, avoiding situations or people associated with the sort of guilt, self de- self-destructive behaviors, a tendency to seek punishment or self-harm, and a preoccupation with the source of the guilt. And cognitively, I've seen this so many times, intrusive and repetitive thoughts about the wrongdoing. Rumination and overthinking, difficulty forgiving oneself, a sense of being unworthy or undeserving, and a skewed perception of one's actions, an often overly negative skewed perspective. And interpersonally, guilt can show up looking like difficulty in forming or maintaining relationships, isolation and withdrawal from loved ones, an inclination to apologize excessively or seek reassurance from others and a fear of judgment or rejection. I'm sure we all know intense or chronic feelings of guilt are 
absolutely distressing and can truly affect one's daily life. Now, guilt can be real or imagined. It can have a shred of truth or be based on competing values. For example, a common experience of guilt could go like this. I feel guilty when I don't visit my mother as much as I should, but I also really want to have free time after work and go run or watch my favorite show. The key words here are should. As you know, us therapists love to say, quit shitting all over yourself. But seriously there. So the key words here are should, and there is also a belief about how much time one should spend with their parent. There's also a value of enjoying free time. Sometimes people experience ambivalence and they confuse it for guilt, or it makes them feel guilty like they have done something wrong for feeling two ways about something or for two things being true at the same time. In this case, it can be helpful to break it down with the client about the specifics of the feelings of their guilt, like asking questions, getting at the roots of some of those things we talked about, the shoulds, the values, and the core beliefs possibly. So like how much time should you be spending with your mother? Um, Does your mother have a different definition? Whose is right? Is your value of relaxing in your free time more important than your value of spending time with family? Whose definition is right or more important? How can you prioritize? You know, kind of getting in and maybe challenging a little bit of those ideas that you're doing something wrong when maybe you're, you're, you're just not. And these are just a few points of assessment. But while working with guilt and shame, it's important to address somatic experiences that accompany it which can at times be equally as powerful as the thoughts. When you think about how much time you should spend with your mother, what do you notice in your body? You can also gently bring to awareness any somatic responses you notice as the clinician. This can help the client identify which particular points are bringing up distressing or uncomfortable sensations that may be linked to the guilt. Sometimes a person is ravaged with guilt for a situation in which some level makes sense, like a person dealing with a child abuse case or a person who has hurt someone during active addiction or any other time we've played a role in relational rupture, which is inevitable if you have contact with humans. We will hurt people to varying degrees on purpose and not on purpose over and over again which we'll discuss in more detail later. So in assessing problematic guilt, it's helpful to distinguish between guilt, which is proportionate to whatever the individual has done, from disproportionate guilt, which is more imagined or not necessarily based on the actual actions of wrongdoing. So let's get a little bit more into proportionate guilt and disproportionate guilt, which are research terms, so we'll just use those. Proportionate guilt is guilt for an action, decision, or other wrongdoing for which you can take responsibility, which others may have been negatively affected by. And um, this is that functional guilt that we were talking about that can spur you to address ruptures, creating social cohesion and a shared sense of responsibility. Now, disproportionate guilt can be subdivided into guilt disproportionate to an actual act and guilt related to a thought, feeling, or imagined act. The question of whether imagining or thinking something harmful is as severe as actually doing it is actually a pretty interesting um, issue. But the most extreme example of disproportionate guilt is seen in many clients with depression and like this delusional guilt. Such clients may be tormented by the belief that they are like responsible for a global catastrophe, like an earthquake, which I have worked with clients that have felt that way before. So that's a pretty extreme form of disproportionate guilt. So the client faces the complex judgment of how active they can be in encouraging the individual to face the reality of the guilt and methods that feel acceptable and supportive to the client. So we're not going to focus as much here on working with that like 
delusional guilt or that really extreme disproportional guilt because that probably ties more into working with OCD or PTSD type of issues, which uh, that's for another show. But today we're going to talk about proportionate guilt into a lesser degree disproportionate guilt. So the first and foremost, most studied aspect of that uh, is forgiveness and self-forgiveness. It is studied and widely used intervention in the face of relentless guilt and shame. Unsurprisingly, forgiveness can be supportive of our overall health and well-being. Research from 2016 suggests forgiveness can reduce stress and improve mental health. Results from a 2017 study also show that forgiveness can increase positive emotions, improve relationships, enhance spiritual growth, and boost empowerment. For the purposes of working with guilt and shame, we're going to focus today on self-forgiveness, and that's versus the forgiveness of others who have harmed you. In the psychology literature, self-forgiveness has been defined as, quote, a willingness to abandon self-resentment in the face of one's own acknowledged objective wrong while fostering compassion, generosity, and love toward oneself, end quote. Now, I think the concept of forgiveness can be rife with cultural meaning, and it evokes all kinds of emotions and memories like religious, historical, cultural, and personal associations. Often, our definitions or the way we perceive a concept will affect how we interact with it. So we really need to be mindful of how these loaded concepts like forgiveness can be helpful or unhelpful depending on how the client perceives it and for the specific guilt or shame you're working with. Like forgiving an abuser is different from forgiving yourself from a mistake you made in eighth grade and requires different levels of tolerance, coping skills, and time. So I'm going to embarrassingly use myself, well, not embarrassingly, I'm going to proudly use myself as an example. When I started really working with my shame and guilt, which for me is pervasive and intense and um, a big part of my mental health work, um, forgiveness came up. And I started to realize that it, forgiveness just, I couldn't even think about it. It just seemed gross to me um, because it was associated with like a forced coercion to make peace within a family system or as a method of manipulation and control from a group or system seeking to maintain power by rationalizing or gaslighting. We've all seen the kiss and make up kind of approach to dealing with conflict or even abuse or the ex- the uh, like accept my apology so we can just get on with it or we can just be done with it, which is code for not discussing or addressing the concerns of the wrongdoings. So I'm highly resistant to the idea of forgiveness, even when it comes to myself. So when I was working with this, um, because again, like I said, I was having strong resentments that were like really disrupting my daily life task. I realized I needed another word to use, even to just feel open to the idea of working with self-forgiveness. So I decided to use the word understanding rather than forgiveness. And sometimes I use the word reconciliation. Both of these words have associations for me that allow, just allow me to be more open to the idea of applying it to myself. On a side note, here at the Academy of Integrative Mental Health, we harp on this quite a bit, but language is so, so important and it's very much essential to address in mental health treatment. It can either limit or expand our perception of the world, influence our emotional experiences, and guide our behaviors based on the meanings and associations we attach to words and expression. So I recommend being very mindful of this in your work. Okay, so on to some approaches towards self-forgiveness to address guilt. So for example, when, it, when we're addressing guilt, when it's been determined that harm has been done. So you would address it differently if the harm is imagined, like we said. And sometimes self-forgiveness can work with that too, because even if it's imagined, we're really feeling it. Sometimes it's impossible to um, convince yourself otherwise. You might as well just maybe just go with this. First step is being mindful of timing. Approaching forgiveness too soon can be detrimental, as it can mean breezing past the emotional experiences and awarenesses of all aspects of the situation. People need general emotional intelligence, 
a window of tolerance and safety to work with something complex like forgiveness. Also, if trauma is associated, um, it's a good idea to address the general trauma first. Forgiveness concepts seem to be near the end of the process for most individuals. So you could start by acknowledging the actual hurt caused. Some people have an unrealistic sense of the amount of hurt or the degree of the harm. It's important to note that people in psychologically manipulative or abusive relationships have been conditioned to believe that things are their fault or will take the blame for things that have nothing to do with their behavior. So be mindful of this aspect when working with wrongdoing and guilt. Um, Likewise, folks can be conditioned by their family of origin or high control religious groups and even their culture to take responsibility for wrongdoing that is not actually caused by their behavior. So make sure to take the time to identify the specific consequences of the behavior for which the guilt stems to help avoid the risks of over or under blaming. So once you have an idea of the proportion of guilt and have identified the actual behavior that is the source, then you can move on to self-forgiveness and possibly even making amends. So one of the biggest and first steps is cultivating self-compassion. I know we've all heard of it, and I know that it's a frequent therapeutic approach for a variety of issues that come up in therapy. Yet when working with persistent guilt and shame, it is a very wise skill to continue to nurture. Many people find it extremely difficult to offer gentleness in the face of big emotions or feel like they can't let themselves off the hook or they might become too self-indulgent or an asshole. I hear that a lot, and I've probably said that myself. But the reality is, is that you will mess up. You will mess up. You will make mistakes. You will react in ways you wish you didn't, and so will other people. No matter the relentless pressure you put on yourself or not. Again, work with words that are a good fit for the client. Maybe swapping out kindness with acceptance, support, encouragement, consideration, etc. If we push compassion too much or too soon, or even just saying to a client, you are worthy, you can make mistakes. While it can be beneficial for one to hear, it's always best when the client says those things about themselves and comes up with it in a way that works for them. So yes, we can say these things, but wouldn't it be so much better if the person, the client says it about themselves? Wow, I can make mistakes. I can make mistakes and I'm worthy. One approach could be to, again, to ask exploratory questions about what it would look like or feel like to have compassion towards oneself in the face of such intense thoughts and feelings of making a mistake or harming others. So questions like, what could happen if, or what are some negatives to such and such? And and by exploring this, you get the sense of like how... This person has a relationship with compassion. What would self-compassion look like? What are the resistance to self-compassion? Um, is it, does it hurt? Does it feel good? Um, these are really important aspects to explore. So it's not just about the act of compassion. It's the act of the relationship we have with compassion, right? Toward ourselves and others. A lot of us just believe we need to be hard on ourselves to be successful or to avoid mistakes. But Again, the reality is we can learn and mature through mistakes because they're inevitable, remember? Still, we've been taught that if we don't criticize ourselves for our failures, then we won't take responsibility for ourselves or cultivate discipline. What really keeps us accountable, though, mindful and in charge of our actions and reactions, are awareness from an objective lens. And that can only happen when we loosen the reins and soften our approach. Self-criticism is evolutionary and influenced by temperament. Our tendency to be critical of ourselves may be rooted in our genes. Early humans depended on each other's contributions to survive. If someone made a mistake, it could spell hardship for the entire group. Despite living in modern times, we're still hardwired to be diligent about making mistakes. Temperament can also affect our level of self-criticism. Some people can be troubled by events that would not bother 
another person. Like, AKA, I have literally apologized to a power line pole for running into it. And others are more prone to exaggerating small mistakes into huge crises, a tendency called catastrophic thinking. That's also another, a whole nother episode. So when we're working with increasing and cultivating self-compassion, one excellent approach is common humanity. Acknowledging the interconnected nature of our lives is an aspect of common humanity. The truth is who we are, how we think, and how we behave is inextricably interwoven with other people and events. In other words, you didn't get to where you are today all by yourself, despite the concept of rugged individualism. It is helpful to continue to look for the causes and conditions that led you and others to behavior patterns from from an objective and systematic lens. It's not all on you. As Kristen Neff writes in her research on self-compassion, quote, when we begin to recognize that we are a product of countless factors, we don't need to take our personal failings so personally. When we acknowledge the intricate web of causes and conditions in which we are all embedded, we can be less judgmental of ourselves and others. A deep understanding of interconnectedness allows us to have compassion for the fact that we are doing our best given the hand life has dealt us, end quote. To support one in simultaneously holding the contrasting experiences of both being a person of worth and being a person who has hurt others, try to access a psychological state that we call the wise self. In this state, similar to the concept of wise mind described in DBT, you can make use of both your emotions and logic. You can acknowledge that two things that might feel contradictory can actually both be true. Thinking in this way can help you avoid defensiveness or self-abasement as you reflect on past behavior. One way to do this is to write about it. Focus on your thoughts and feelings about the regretted behavior and then describe them in text. As you get started, write as much or as little as you feel comfortable with answering the following questions, possibly. What are the worst parts of the events? What am I feeling as I recall the events? What do I tend to do when these feelings come up? What thoughts about myself, the situation, the person that was harmed, or others I care about, are associated with these memories. What would I do differently if I could go back? And these are just some possible questions. Another thing that you can do is create art to express your feelings. For some, it's harder to describe feelings through prose than it is to use other forms of creative expression. If that's the cause for you, then drawing, painting, music, dance, or poetry could be better options. Make use of whatever tendencies or skills you have to express yourself. Another option is to practice restorative justice for self-forgiveness. Learning about and trying to practice a form of restorative justice can help you work towards self-forgiveness. Restorative justice is about restoration, returning something to its earlier condition or position. While restorative justice attempts to right wrongdoing to someone else or society, it can also restore something within yourself. It can restore a sense of dignity and wholeness, for example. The focus of restorative justice is on accountability and making amends, not on self-degradation or punishment. It goes beyond self-cleansing and does more than just make you feel good. It helps prepare relationships and a sense of self within the world. You can't always go back and right a wrong from the past, but you can make amends in some other way. If you were stingy in the past, for example, you can be generous in what you do today. If you bullied someone in the past, you can be kind to someone today. If you were indifferent or neglectful to someone in the past, you can be attentive or caring to someone today. And again, if the guilt or the wrongdoing was on yourself, it was an action that you feel that harmed you and that you had a role in it, you can make amends to yourself in the same way. 
right? You can be attentive and caring to yourself now. Did you let yourself down by not standing up when somebody was being harmed, for example? Well, you can stand up now by advocating or you can advocate for your own self to not be harmed. Um, These are all ways of practicing uh, restorative justice with yourself. So if you decide, so, okay, we've talked a lot about all these different aspects of guilt and forgiveness and increasing, cultivating compassion. For some people, making amends will be a part of their journey of uh, working with guilt. So you can either do that directly or indirectly. So once the remorse has been embraced and expressed, you know, within yourself and maybe with your therapist or whatever, it is time for restoration. The restoration involves attempts at repairing the harm caused by the past behavior, as well as reorientation toward any personal values that were violated. So maybe you can start with considering, should you pursue direct amends or indirect amends or both? A direct amends is essentially, in some other words, or in one way of saying an apology. And one way of doing that directly is just to dialogue with the person that was harmed. Um, so this can happen in a simple phone call, an email. I know that people that have made amends to me will say something like, Hey, you know, I recognize if say this was an amends of something that like we hadn't discussed previously, they'd say something like, Hey, I noticed that I said such and such, and that might've been harmful to you. Or, you know what? This happened a few years ago and we never really discussed it. And I'd like to talk about it because I want to uh, address my role in this or whatever. It could look like that. In more serious cases, this is not always possible or desirable. Um, Although the restorative justice movement has shown that dialogue can facilitate forgiveness. But for some clients, particularly those who identify with certain religions or spirituality, could benefit from asking their higher power or God or creator hand it over, to borrow a phrase from AA, just hand it over to God. And sometimes the amends is simply made um, with yourself and your higher power. So that's one way of approaching it if a direct amends is not available to you. And I'm thinking about possibly doing a little teeny, little teeny bonus to this one. Um, Little teeny bonus, maybe like a five minute five minute or about doing a, um, the anatomy of a really good apology. And this could be an apology to yourself or an apology to somebody else, because there's a lot of apologies out there that just are garbage and are not actual apologies. Um, they're just defensive, um, unregulated messes. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's so rude. But anyway, so I think I might add an addendum to this cause it's episodes getting really long. So, hmm. We'll see. Put it in the comments if you want the anatomy of a really good apology. But anyhow, in conclusion, addressing severe guilt within therapy requires a sensitive and empathetic approach. Therapists play a crucial role in helping clients navigate their feelings of guilt by creating safe and non-judgmental space for them to explore and understand the underlying causes. Through open dialogue, self-compassion, exercises, and promoting self-forgiveness, Therapists can guide clients toward a healthier relationship with their guilt. By encouraging clients to acknowledge their responsibility while also recognizing the potential for growth and healing, therapists empower individuals to move forward with greater self-acceptance and a reduced burden of severe guilt. Ultimately, the therapeutic journey involves transforming guilt into a catalyst for personal transformation and positive change, enabling clients to build a more fulfilling and balanced life. I hope this discussion has been helpful for you on common client conundrums. And please, please, please stay tuned for part two. We're going to get all into shame in part two. Drop some comments or we even have um, an ability for you to uh, leave a voice message on our speak pipe. If you have anything to add on this conversation around guilt and working with guilt, uh, I'd love to hear any personal experiences, obviously leaving out client, personal client, confidential client information, but uh, anything that we can do to support this conversation for you, we would love it. All right. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast.
podcast, please, because we really would like to get some cheese. No, I'm just playing. Oh, that was really weird. Okay, that's going to go in the blooper reel. No, seriously, though. Please don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, follow, all the things that help the algorithm to decide whether to show, to suggest this podcast or YouTube to those who might actually really enjoy it or who would like to engage in the dialogue with us because that's the ultimate goal is to create a community where we can have these discussions uh, around mental health issues as clinicians and to be able to explore um, and talk and support each other. So, all right. Thank you all so much. And I hope that everybody got through the holidays. Okay. I did not, it was not a good time, but it's not for some people. And I hope that you are doing lots of good processing around that with yourselves and your clients. And then the algorithm will show other people the thing. And then maybe we can really, I am not doing well here.